right, thanks for putting up with that musical introduction to uh, today's recording. Um, uh, I hope it gave you a sense of, of joy and happiness, uh, for that is uh, the quality of the song. Um, I'll explain more about the song itself as part of our work. Um, and you guys do have reason to rejoice, um, not only for the new and wonderful opportunity to learn about the subjunctive, uh, but also because uh, this is going to herald the return of phrases of the day um, as part of your Latin instruction. And um, it's just, it's kind of like they're going to be pouring out in a flood um, because for most of the grammatical points we're going to be covering, um, there is an accompanying phrase of the day that in a normal school year we would meet one or two at a time. But um, I want to get to the point and make this time efficient. Um, here are my observations about the subjunctive. Um, if I were reading what had been in the textbook, um, if I had maybe um, taken a little bit of extra initiative and watched a YouTube video, um, and these are the things that I would tell myself uh, to help me understand the subjunctive. Um, I hope these ring true with what you have learned so far. Latin subjunctive forms have uh, really distinctive unreal looking vowel shifts. Um, so from the previous lecture um, and work that you've done, um, you know that uh, all of a sudden in a first conjugation verb, there's an E showing up to identify the present subjunctive. In a fourth conjugation verb, there's an IA uh, to indicate the subjunctive. And those vowels seem to clash with reality. Um, with our established reality for understanding how a specific verb conjugation works. Hold on to that thought of clashing with reality. Um, I'd also pull from the textbook that uh, English subjunctive forms usually rely on or have distinctive modal auxiliary verbs. Modal auxiliary verbs means that they change the mood of the sentence. Um, and since English relies on auxiliary verbs almost exclusively now to change things like tense and voice, um, we should also expect that auxiliary verbs will be used to change the mood. Um, third point, I'm going to emphasize this. The subjunctive is used to suggest a variety of not necessarily real actions. The subjunctive is rarely used to indicate facts or certainties. Okay. Um, you guys as teenagers know that your, your attitude, your viewpoint on the world shapes the nature of the world. I hope you know that. Um, you are not helpless children. You are uh, active um, uh, agents of your own destiny and your attitude changes how the world operates. Um, and it doesn't mean that you can wish away world hunger or that you can wish away homework. Um, but you know that if you set about the homework um, without procrastination and um, as soon after a lesson as possible, you're going to get through it better, more successfully, and so on. The subjunctive is the mood of imagination, of dreams. Uh, on the dark side, it's uh, also a language of the, the mood of regret or fear. Um, we'll talk more about that when we're back together uh, in person. Okay, last observation. Um, most of the uses of the subjunctive that we will learn are joined under sub yunctus from the verb yongo, yongere, yongsi, yongtus, and the preposition sub. Most uses of the subjunctive are sub yongtus, a dependent clause. They're joined under a dependent clause by a subordinating conjunction. Um, those uses of the subjunctive for dependent or subordinate clauses um, are a semester-long learning project for us. 
um, today we are going to be learning the independent uses of the subjunctive. And in these independent uses of the subjunctive, the subjunctive can and really is the main verb. It's used in an independent clause, the main clause in the sentence. Um, these five uses, and you might be a little bit frightened by the number five, um, because that means more than one, more than two, etc. That means you're going to have to think and learn, but that's your job. Um, these five independent uses of the subjunctive um, are going to be classified, and you're going to recognize them based on certain grammatical features, like is the subjunctive first person plural, um, is it third person singular, those things will matter, and context. The context is going to be key to understanding and translating these. The third bullet point on this slide, it's super repetitive. Um, the subjunctive is used to suggest a variety of not necessarily real actions rather than to indicate facts or certainties. So the verb is communicating maybe a hoped for action, um, a goal, um, a potential outcome that would be positive or negative. Okay. Um, some of these subjunctives will use a new and special negative adverb, nay, rather than known when the sentence is expressing a negative idea, one that the speaker does not want to happen or does not envision happening. So um, as part of the vocab for chapter 10, we're going to encounter um, nay, um, and we'll spend some time working with that uh, again when we're alive and in person. But please make a note on the following slide of when nay is used versus when known is used. The term volative that our textbook uses to describe several independent uses of the subjunctive is not very helpful. Um, it's okay, but it's not precise. Um, <clears throat> it's like having one tool in your toolbox, a hammer, uh, when you need instead a screwdriver or a saw. The word volative comes from the Latin verb, the irregular verb you've been exposed to, volo, vela, meaning want or wish. And the term volative um, suggest that the subjunctive action is a wish. And that's not totally wrong, but again, it's not super precise. So here are the names, just the names, of the five independent uses of the subjunctive. Hortatory, Yusiv, which is my spelling, Joseph is used in the textbook, optative, potential, and deliberative. Pause the slide and make note of which is negated by nay and which is negated by known, because I won't be telling you that as we go through examples of each. All right, assuming you're back. Um, we're going to start off first with the hortatory subjunctive. The name may sound a little bit funny, um, but you guys will get used to it. Um, and later, we're going to be learning the Latin verb that is the root of this English derivative. That root shows up in the English word exhort. So if I exhort my team to victory, if I deliver an exhortation to a group of um, athletes before they go into competition, I am urging or encouraging those people, my team, um, my uh, athletes, if I'm a coach, I'm exhorting them to a course of action, to be bold or so on. But the key thing about the hortatory subjunctive, and again, I'm asking you to make note of this, um, is that it's always first person plural. The speaker is part of a group and is exhorting the group toward a specific action. 
it's always translated, as you can see up here, with the phrase, let us, or in a slightly more um, colloquial fashion, let's. Okay. Um, here's an example um, that is going to maybe surprise you. Some of you may not care about it if you're not baseball fans. Um, but one baseball team uh, located in Chicago at Wrigley Field, that's their home team, uh, sorry, their home stadium, uh, has a sign in Latin um, that some fans put up, Aamos Catuli. Um, the verb eo, um, which is slightly irregular, um, is a verb that means go. And if you take a look at aamos catuli, the a in aamos is the sign that it's subjunctive. Um, can you guys translate this? Aamos catuli. You're probably wondering what catuli means. Okay, so if you know baseball, it's a team in Chicago in the National League, plays at Ridley Field, Mr. Griffin's favorite baseball team, it's the Cubs. So aamos catuli means let's go Cubs. Let's go Cubs. And um, if you have an engagement with um, professional sports or college sports or devil in sports, um, even if you're not an athlete on the team, when you're a fan, you, you view yourself as part of that group. Um, and that's why these are in the first person plural. It's the fan saying, we're on the team. We're cheering you on. Let's go Cubs. All right, uh, speaking of cub, um, we have um, a visual which takes us not to Catuli, the Chicago Cubs, but Catullus, the Roman poet who was, uh, well, just a little lovesick puppy, uh, if you remember our work with Catullus in Latin three. Um, by the way, on this slide, the information on the left is the same information that is on the slide we just discussed, but it's a reminder of Catullus viewing himself as part of a group. You may recall this line from Catullus' poem 5, Carmen 5, We vamos me a lesbiat qua memos. I'm reading it with the elisions that occur, but in this instance, Catullus is viewing himself and his uh, girlfriend, uh, his desired girlfriend, uh, as part of a group, a very small group, a pair. You might remember the root meaning of we woe is live. I hope you do. And I know that you know the root meaning of amo. So pause the slide if need be and rough out a translation of we wamos me a lesbia atque amemos. Yep. It is, let us live, my lesbia, and let us love. So an old phrase of the day, making another new appearance. Here, woohoo, we have um, some of the initial music of the song that I used at the beginning of this PowerPoint. Gaudeamus egetur, uenestum sumus. And I'll stop singing because you don't need to suffer anymore. Um, to clarify, this is a medieval college student's song. It's part of a collection of songs um, that were written by uh, students learning Latin in medieval universities as part of their preparation for studies of law, etc. And the members of this university wrote a song, um, actually sang it at my graduation from college, um, that, that marks usually the transition from um, youthful collegiate students to functioning adults with jobs. Okay. Um, the verb gaudeo al gaudere means be happy or rejoice. And yes, gaudeamos is a hortatory subjunctive. My translation of this, let us therefore rejoice 
while we are young. And as these college students look forward to the next stage in life, they're going to pause and reflect, hey, we're still young. We just graduated. Let's celebrate. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, by the way, you can easily search out a recording of the song um, and uh, maybe even the sheet music. All right. Let's move on to a new type of um, subjunctive, which I call the Yusuf subjunctive. Her textbook calls it Joseph. Um, the spelling alteration of I to J is something you can cope with uh, because you're smart young Latin scholars. In terms of the formal appearance of the Yusuf or Joseph, it may be second person or third person. The sentence, the verb in the sentence may be active or passive. There's a great amount of variety with the Yusuf or Joseph. In the context of this use of the subjunctive, it's worth noting that the speaker is going to be speaking from a position of power, position of authority or command, because he or she or they um, will be giving an order. And you guys recall from Latin too, one of the Latin verbs for order is ubeo, ubeare, iosi, iosus. And it is, in fact, from that verb that this use of the subjunctive, Yosef, or Joseph, gets its name. So, once again, this is being used to give an order. It is slightly more polite than an imperative. But there's also an advantage in that an order can be phrased in the third person. Okay. The translations... Various translations work. Uh, the most common is let, um, but we could also use should in the translation. We can also simply use uh, an English command um, that would be borderline uh, a request, maybe. Uh, so to set the context, uh, we have an image of Marie Antoinette. Um, no, that is not a bobblehead doll. That's uh, a portrait of Marie Antoinette. Um, and what allegedly did she say when informed about uh, the Parisians lacking sufficient bread to live well? If you know the, the I want to call it a legend, the urban legend about Marie Antoinette, she allegedly said, let them eat cake. Um, that's a poor translation of what she actually said in French, but it's that idea of well, if the people aren't common, people aren't happy, let them eat cake. Or we could paraphrase that as they should eat cake. Um, Want to notice that this particular command is third person. So Marie Antoinette was actually speaking to one of her courtiers, um, if we believe the legend. Um, and she was speaking, giving a command through the courtier to people who were not present the Parisians themselves. All right, so um, again, same information on the left-hand side of the slide. On the right, we have an image. Um, I don't know if you guys remember in Latin 3, uh, Mackay's poor choice, poor choice of automobile. Um, when he you know, paid cash up front for a car and then found it sitting on blocks and stripped. Okay, well, uh, I have documentary proof in the form of this photograph that Mackay made the same mistake twice. When the first car broke down, he decided to buy the one that you see in this illustration and paid cash for it. He then mowed money in advance, went to pick up the car and found it inoperative. How silly Mackay is. Well, if... Mackay tried to take the seller of the car to court um, to get his money back for a non-operative vehicle, which he had been assured was in perfect condition, and appeared in the court of Judge Judy. I can very much picture Judge Judy spouting from the bench this 
principle or maxim that everyone should bear in mind when they make private purchases, not purchases from an established licensed business, but from private parties. It's the maxim kaweat emptor. Emptor means buyer, a buyer, a person who purchases. And you guys know kaweo kawere from the phrase kawe kanem. Well, kaweat emptor is a third person Yosef subjunctive. Let the buyer beware. All right. Um, we're going to make really quick work of this phrase of the day. Um, I hate to do it because this is historically one of the most important um, documents pertaining to civil rights. And in particular, the civil rights of enslaved people who have gained their freedom. I would love to talk about the case of a Spanish slaving ship called the Amistad, uh, but I'm going to save that for another time, and you'll probably learn a fair bit about it in U.S. history. But in this case, um, a document called a writ of habeas corpus, I'm using the very English pronunciation of it, a writ of habeas corpus was issued by a judge who was demanding that the authorities, the police, bring physically the slaves who had gained their freedom on the ship Amistad into the courtroom. Literally, habeas corpus means have the body or you should have the body. It's a condensed expression. It means literally bring the prisoner, and not literally, figuratively, bring the prisoner to court so that I can talk to him, so that I can interview him. And um, it's one of the principles of our government and our judicial system that a person cannot be held prisoner indefinitely a person cannot be held in prison without the uh, opportunity to appear before a judge and for the judge to evaluate is the imprisonment justified or not. So it's an important principle of American law. Um, it's in Latin, habeas corpus, and it's again a use of subjunctive where a judge in a position of power orders the police or the sheriff or the FBI in the modern world um, to bring an accused person to court so that the accusations against them can be weighed. All right, so we are going to move forward eventually. Um, I'd like to now shift to the third use of the subjunctive. It's called the optative subjunctive. Once again, it may be any person, the first, second, or third. It can be active or passive. In context, the speaker is not in a position of control. The speaker is not in a position of power. That would be a Yosef subjunctive. But the optative subjunctive is used when the speaker is making a wish, a request, or a prayer. It's related to a Latin verb you haven't officially met, opto optare. In Latin, opto optare means choose or express a desire for. It's where we get the English verb opt or option. So when I go to a restaurant, I like to have options. Um, if it's a Mexican restaurant, burrito, taco, something else, you know, who knows? Um, and I express my option. Oh, I'd like chile rellanos. Uh, I opted to order chile rellanos, but if they're out of chile rellanos, I don't get it. So our choices and our wishes are not always fulfilled. <laughs> Um, 
that's true of teenagers and adults alike. But let's move away from the philosophical uh, question of whether wishes are fulfilled to look at translation strategies. Okay. Um, various translations can work. Let is going to be a good one. May is going to be a good one. Sometimes even a simple English command, but again, I wanna make note that this command is, is more along the lines of a request or a prayer. Um, I don't know if you have ever said to somebody, forgive me, forgive me. It's phrased as a command, but you and I know if you've ever been in the position of asking for forgiveness, the other person doesn't have to grant it. The subjunctive in an optative um, can express such a, a wish, uh, an urgent request, but one that you don't have the power to fulfill. Um, and the perfect example would be uh, what the Jedi uh, say to wish each other well. When one Jedi has no control over another one and whether that person is successful in their mission, they say, may the force be with you. Here's another one. Um, I'm, it's entirely possible you don't recognize the character uh, from the illustration, but if you think about the Hunger Games, which is the uh, book or movie in this instance, which I'm asking you to think of, uh, there's a saying that is constantly repeated when the uh, tributes from each district go off into battle um, in the Hunger Games. I have given you a, a Latin version of that, Fortuna Tibi Semper Faweat, and you guys are going to recognize probably the expression, may the odds be ever in your favor. It's a wish. Uh, sometimes you wonder whether the wish is sincere in the Hunger Games, but it's framed in the optative using the English helping verb, auxiliary verb, may. Here's another pop culture reference. Uh, my, my spirit animal, Spock, I, I wish he were my spirit animal, um, has a greeting and a farewell in the fictional Star Trek universe um, that he constantly uses um, to express good wishes to friends, family members, etc. We was diu et crescas. I know that you guys can translate we was diu. Crescas in context you're going to see as, translated as prosper. So this expression, live long and prosper, is in English, again, expressing the idea of an optative subjunctive, a wish or a prayer. Okay. I've got one more for you. Um, this is from the realm, I suppose, of contemporary culture, um, pop culture perhaps, if you're into the Bill and Ted movies or the, no, never mind. We don't want to go down that road. Um, as you look at the image, what figure of pop culture or um, religion slash mythology contemporary is represented there? Yep, it's death. Um, here portrayed holding a scythe, you see the staff of the scythe, and death is often personified as, well, someone who is harvesting souls. Um, so if I give you the phrase, ne timeas mesorem, I want to call attention, this is our one and only um, use of the subjunctive, featuring ne. So this is a negative uh, wish, a wish that something not happen or a request that the person being spoken to not do a specific action. 
And what's the action? Yep, it's furing. Okay. Ne timeas mesorem. Don't fear the reaper. Don't fear the reaper. Uh, as in, don't be afraid of death. Um, we can later debate the merits of being afraid of death. Um, but before we move on, I want you guys to notice the speaker did not choose a negative imperative, did not use an actual Latin command form. Instead of noli temere mesorem, mesorem, excuse me, instead of noli temere mesorem, the speaker chose to use the subjunctive. This is something that's very subtle. The speaker is saying, I don't have control over what you fear. I, the speaker, don't have direct control or influence over what you think, what you believe, what you feel. But it is my wish, it is my prayer, it is my hope that you are able to put fear aside. All right, so this is the subtle, um, subtle thing that the subjunctive does. It looks at issues of uncertainty, of, mm, well, wishes and doubts and fears. All right, one last, <laughs> one last optative subjunctive um, that has actually been a phrase of the day before, um, but you guys are now in a position to fully cope with the grammar. It's a quotation from Cicero. Um, it is also, um, was also the territorial motto of Wyoming. Uh, Wyoming, which was formed after the Civil War in the United States, had as its motto a quotation from Cicero, which reflected Cicero's hopes or wishes as expressed in one of his speeches during the periods of civil war in Rome. <clears throat> when Cicero was advocating for a return to peaceful civil interactions instead of violent military behavior between citizens of the same country. He coined the phrase, Cadant Arma Togai. Instead of <clears throat> a lorica, a breastplate, and shield, and greaves, and helmet, Roman citizens, when dealing with each other, should put on the toga. That's the idea. But what I'm going to ask you guys to do is translate Kadon Arma Togai, pausing as you need to, to think through the vocab words. Here's my translation. Let weapons yield to the toga. Let weapons yield to the toga. All right. So let's move on to the potential subjunctive. Um, I'm going to make this try to make this quick. I don't have a lot of Latin examples for the last two uses of the subjunctive. I'm going to call out up front, even though it's on the slide, <clears throat> it's, uh, sorry, it is not on the slide, that the potential subjunctive would be negated by known, by known, rather than nay. As far as the gra other grammatical features, the potential subjunctive may be in any person. It may be active or passive. Context. The speaker is asserting a potential, der, <laughs> a potential but hypothetical action. So a hypothetical action where the speaker is not speaking with certainty, is speaking with uncertainty about what may happen, what another person would do under hypothetical circumstances. Okay. Um, a quick caution, 
we often think of potential um, as automatically indicating the idea of ability or power. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Excuse me. When, for example, we think of the word potent, um, so um, a missile is a potent weapon of destruction. It means powerful. And we also know that the word potent and potential come from possum, uh, which means I am able. But the, the name potential here does not emphasize power or ability. Instead, it, hmm, well, it focuses on possibility. If we think about possibility in that sense of, oh, it could go either way, um, that's what the potential subjunctive suggests. The various translation strategies, may, might, and would, are uh, available to you. I personally uh, would like to chuck the word might out the window, um, but the textbook is going to use it, and there will be times when you will use it, uh, but don't worry, I won't chuck you out the window. It's just that you're not going to hear me use it um, for reasons you'll learn later. But may or would are great translations. I don't know if you remember from way back in the day, um, the commercials that were put on TV for Klondike bars. I happen to like Klondike bars. And so potentially, I would cancel homework for the whole semester for a Klondike bar. So if you get me one in the next 15 minutes, okay, that potential outcome might happen. I would cancel homework for the whole semester in exchange for a Klondike bar. You can tell that this action is not a certainty, that it's being dangled out there as a possibility, but the speaker, me, I, I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen. This is a nuance, the difference between using the future indicative to indicate certainty about what will happen versus using the present subjunctive to indicate possibility. Now, I have one example to offer you. Okay. <clears throat> what do you think about weather people, the weather man or the weather woman? Kathy Sabin, or um, gosh, I can't think of other weather people from television. Um, right, they, they're, they are always dealing in the world of potential with their weather forecasts. So dredge up from your memory um, that the root meaning of pluot is rain as a verb. So pluot, outknown pluot, Please note the negative known. Okay. It may rain or it may not rain. Okay. Ah, I wish that weather forecasters were able to speak with more certainty, um, but that's life. Okay. Everything is uncertain at, um, at various points. All right, the last use of the subjunctive. Um, and please pardon me, whoops. Um, for throwing at you this one. It's not in our textbook for a long, long, long time. It's called the deliberative subjunctive. Okay. The verb may be any person, may be active or passive, but it will always be in a question. So I put a, a question mark as part of that description. Here's the context. The speaker is in doubt about a course of action, whoops, is thinking and is really unsure and is so unsure that he or she is talking to himself or talking about somebody else saying, oh my gosh, what, what should he do? What is he to do? Uh, what am I to do? These phrases that in English rely on various helping verb structures are what we use to ask questions in which we are deliberating. 
we're deliberating, we're thinking out loud, weighing two or more options. Various translations can work, including should. But I want you guys to notice this is should phrased in a question. Am I, or are you, or is he, with an infinitive after that? What am I to cook for dinner tonight? Uh, we're out of this, that, and the other thing. What am I to cook for dinner? What should I cook for dinner? I don't know. <clears throat> we can also use the word would. Okay. As in the question, well, what would be best? What am I to do? What should be done about this? Okay. So all of these are deliberative questions that a character might, in the novel or in life, uh, might verbalize when uncertain and weighing a course of action. And without asking you to um, make a choice, frankly, you're too young to make a choice that um, officially counts, I, I want to pose to you the, the question that a lot of people, as we have our ballots uh, in the 2020 election, are deliberating right now. We have, woohoo, thank you, America, the freedom to choose our leaders. But sometimes individuals approach their decisions with a degree of uncertainty. If a person is approaching marking his or her ballot with a degree of uncertainty. A person might ask this, it's, it's a borderline rhetorical question, but it's not really a rhetorical question. It's expressing deliberating, deliberation. Quis patriam ducat? And please pardon the lack of Macron <coughs> on ducat. Who should lead our country? I don't get to give you my answer. I don't want to hear your answer. Um, <clears throat> what I would like to say, though, is that this recording is finished. You now have... <coughs> I, I apologize. You now have ample information to go about the worksheet that is going to ask you to identify certain English expressions as being in one of these five categories. Okay. Um, I look forward to seeing you uh, next week for a resumption of our learning. Uh, but for now, have a great asynchronous Wednesday and a lovely fall break. Okay, Take care, folks.